Hello everybody and uh, wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Duncan Spencer, I'm the Head of Advice and Practice at IOSH and I'd like to welcome you once again to our series of COVID-19 webinars. IOSH, the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health, is a chartered body and the world's largest membership organisation for health and safety professionals. We have over 47,000 members in 130 countries working in nearly every industry sector. Our vision is a, safe, a safer, healthier world of work for everybody. These weekly webinars focus on gathering to share knowledge, experience and expertise. They cover many professional, practical and evidence-based aspects of managing occupational safety and health during this pandemic. Today is the 10th in our series and this IOSH webinar is brought to you in collaboration with key organisations, businesses and professionals concerned with mental health and well-being at work, especially now with the fear and disruption of the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects still overshadowing our daily lives. Among the many pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic um, that has been visited on millions of people this year, anxieties connected to occupational infection risk are just one of the countless new work-related and personal stresses that many are experiencing now or are likely to experience at some time in the future. In our webinar we hosted seven weeks ago on the 16th of April on current risks and challenges and practical measures in protecting health workers responding to COVID-19, we heard from Professor Claudio Colosio, who works in two hospitals in Milan, Italy, that dealt with high levels of COVID-19 and cases among healthcare staff. Along with the clinical and infection risk challenges they were tackling, he also reported growing signs of mental ill health in the latter stages of this crisis. Health worker exhaustion and burnout was becoming an ever greater risk and reality would become more serious long term. His concerns were backed up by other speakers. At the start of this week, um, IOSH put out a new story related to recognising secondary trauma and other psychosocial impacts in, in key workers affected by the pandemic control measures that have been implemented. And only this morning, BBC News here in the UK reported work by King's College London and a survey company called Ipsos Murray, indicating that more than half of the UK population had been struggling with sleep during this lockdown, a sign of stress uh, related to many factors, um, we think. So this uh, webinar is timely in terms of, you know, those are our indicators that have shown us that we, we have to think about anxiety, we have to think about mental well-being as we start to recover from this pandemic and move back into the world of work. So in the next 60 minutes, our speakers will look at psychosocial risks and mitigations and ways to, in, to support workplace mental health. They will explore good practice and uh, from their different areas of expertise. We will discuss the role of the safety and health professional and how they can help working collaboratively with uh, managers and other professionals in supporting colleagues during this time. IOSH members worldwide continue to lead the way in enabling businesses and organisations to respond appropriately during the crisis. They continue to protect colleagues and prevent ill health, as well as helping millions of workers adapt to new ways of working and new challenges. We're proud of how the profession, the profession has responded. I'm delighted today to be joined by our panel of experts. Firstly, uh, representing the British Psychological Society, we have Sharon Demacia, who, is, who will be providing some clinical insight uh, and exploring some of the emotions that are involved and providing reflections from different countries on what uh, leaders, um, OSH professionals, uh, employees and organisations should do. Then we will hear from Emma Mamo, Head of well-being, uh, Workplace Wellbeing at MIND. Emma will be discussing some points that arose from a recent MIND survey, including issues related to home workers and those who have been furloughed. Next is Peter Kelly, who is the senior psychologist with the HSE's Health and, and Work Unit. Peter will be outlining the UK's health and safety executive approach to COVID-19 and provide further insight from different countries. He will also talk us through a couple of models that will help us to prepare for what the future may bring. And finally, we have Tricia O'Neill, who is the head of occupational health and well-being at Skanska UK, and she will be explaining what her business is doing to meet these various uh, challenges. 
After our presentations, our panel of presenters will have time to answer some of your questions. So please take this opportunity to submit them throughout the webinar and we will address as many as we can. I want to emphasize that this and our other webinars are a platform to inform and engage with safety and health professionals and others responsible for safety and health at work. We want to support you with this regular platform for engagement. This is a two-way channel giving you the opportunity to share support and guidance on this evolving issue wherever you are in the world and whichever industry sector you're working. Now more than ever, organizations need authoritative, useful, relevant advice and guidance on managing the safety and health of their workforces. Please visit IOSH's website for the continuously updated COVID-19 advice and guidance we're producing, um, both for the OSH profession and all other organizations who are helping to manage the response and helping to keep uh, staff safe and healthy at work. Um, we have a, a member of the IOSH team in the background who is making sure that everything is, is running well. So thank you to Ben for his background work in advance. Um, I'll now run through some housekeeping points before we begin. Um, all attendees are muted. On your screen, you will notice a small bar with chat and Q&A options. If you have any technical issues or audio problems and need to message us at any point, please use the chat option. If you have any questions for the presenters relating to the content of the session, please post them using the Q&A option. And I will be monitoring that and, and picking out the questions to uh, forward on to our panel at the end of this session. Uh, we have much to, to cover, so I will ask all the speakers to kindly keep to their allotted times so that we do have time for questions. And finally, just so you're aware, this session is being recorded for future playback and sharing. So let's make a start by, first of all, um, going over to Sharon Demacia, uh, the British Psychological Society. Sharon is a chartered occupational psychologist and co-convener of the British Psychological Society's Psychology of Health and Wellbeing Group. She is also the director of Cognoscenti Business Psychologists Limited and works with a range of organizations to help them implement wellbeing systems that work. A published author, she is a supervisor for the Global MBA at the Alliance Manchester Business School and lectures at the University of Reykjavik. So without any further ado, let me welcome Sharon. Sharon, please share your screen. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the session today. So what I'm going to be doing is looking at, I guess, our journey so far with lockdown and what we have to do as we start to come out of it. I think it's worth just taking a, a few seconds just to reflect on the emotional journey that we've been through. So when lockdown first happened, I think we, we all felt a variety of mo emotions, including shock, fear, fear for ourselves, worry about our family and friends, worry about keeping safe, and for a lot of people, financial worries also. How are they going to pay the bills? How are they going to pay the mortgage? And then we sort of settled into that lockdown a little bit and we started to move to what I think of as business as unusual. And that was about adjusting to home working, finding different ways to do work for those of us who were still working. And for those people who were either furloughed or unable to work, they started looking for purpose. So people volunteered to help the NHS, uh, they volunteered to help neighbours and, and other people with um, getting shopping, all sorts of things. But I think there was still that fear, the fear of catching coronavirus, the fear about whether our friends and relatives were, were safe and healthy. And of course, for a lot of people, there was still that financial worry. We're now in a slightly different phase. I know it varies from country to country. And here in the UK, and I think also in, in Spain, we're at the stage of lockdown where we're just starting to move out of it and experience some degree of normality again. So what we're seeing is perhaps a whole new set of fears. We've still got the fear around our personal safety. We've got the fear of if we start meeting more people, and exposing ourselves to other experiences. Are we going to transmit something to our families, our friends? There's fears about using public transport. How are you going to adjust to being with all, 
all those people again, fears about what it's actually going to be like in the workplace, how many people are we going to come into contact with, how safe is it going to be. So I think the underlying message is the fear is not going away. And I think people returning to work are going to need a number of things to, to help them. First of all, they're going to need to be reassured that their physical and psychological safety is protected. They're going to need support from their line manager. They're going to need leaders who they feel have their backs, people who are focused on their well-being and looking after them. They may need, may need support in looking after their mental well-being, and they may also need some help to feel connected with colleagues. It's also worth bearing in mind that some people will not want to return to work at all. And that's going to potentially increase their vulnerability to experiencing mental health issues. Now, because COVID-19 is, is a new virus, we, we don't as yet have massive amounts of, of knowledge about its impact, about its impact on our mental health, either in the short term or long term. So what we have to do at the moment is work with the research we have. And we have research from a variety of countries at the moment some of whom are a little bit ahead of us in terms of what's happening with COVID. And what we know so far is that adults in locations with higher levels of the virus experience higher levels of, of I suppose, mental, mental health impact. Adults with existing health conditions experience worse mental health during lockdown. And adults who actually stopped working experienced a higher risk to their mental health. Now this research actually comes from Greece, but we have seen echoes of that in the UK also. And according to the World Health Organization, the main psychological impact to date has been elevated rates of stress and anxiety, but also higher levels of loneliness, depression, and higher levels of alcohol and drug use, and there is an expectation that levels of self-harm and suicidal behavior will also increase. And a recent study carried out in the US by Joyner and Twenge found that during coronavirus, people were eight times more likely to meet the criteria for a moderate to severe mental Ill, Ill health than they were back in 2018 before coronavirus. Other implications are that we found that just one month of confinement can have a negative impact both on physical and mental health. And for most countries where we've already been in lockdown for longer than that. Uh, a recent survey in Italy found that up to 80% of people needed support to cope with the impact of coronavirus. And there has been an increase in suicides. Now, the increase in suicides has been small, so therefore it could just be a, a blip. However, some of those suicides have been linked to coronavirus, which, which is worrying. And interestingly, in Italy, although freedoms have been restored, many people are still choosing to stay indoors, which I think further exemplifies this, this fear that is still with us. And I think perhaps something that, that is also something to bear in mind is that the World Health Organization is warning that a global mental health crisis is looming based on our experiences of coronavirus. And that is also echoed, echoed by the British Psychological Society in terms of what our research is finding also. So the impact of self-isolation then Sorry, we've got, gone back rather than forward. Apologies for that. So what I'd like to just talk about really and get you thinking about is, is the impact of recovery from COVID-19 and the implications for work. Now, obviously research is still emerging, but what we know so far is that for some people, there is no mental health or no longer term mental health impact of having coronavirus. However, what we also know is those people who face the greatest disadvantages in life also face a greater risk to their mental health. So what that means is people living in disadvantaged areas, people on lower incomes, 
are more likely to be at risk not only of catching coronavirus but also of experiencing mental health issues as a result of that. And there are a number of industries that are habitually lower payers, shall we say. So there's the hospitality industry, sometimes retail industry. So I guess there are going to be certain industries where perhaps we need to be more vigilant. Now, in terms of people who have been seriously ill, critically ill with coronavirus and being hospitalized, what we're seeing is a number of those people do experience some fairly severe mental health impact. So high levels of anxiety, low mood, fear of further illness, hypervigilance about bodily symptoms, flashbacks for some people, poor sleep, and in terms of also of impact on the workplace, impaired memory, effects on attention, concentration, decision making, and fear of stigma, so fear of what other people might think or say, and fear of contaminating others. And our research suggests that the people who are most likely to experience higher levels of those symptoms are those people who perhaps had lower levels of social support, either from the home or the workplace, and people who also have contaminating factors, so uh, higher levels of illness, previous mental health issues, um, people who perhaps have money worries. So in other words, people who have other things going on for them. There are also a whole range of other post-COVID considerations that we will need to consider in terms of getting people back to work. The first thing is realization of loss. Once we start getting people back into workplaces, it will probably quickly become apparent for some people that there are empty chairs, i.e. that colleagues have been lost due to COVID and that's going to trigger reactions of loss, fear, etc. We may also see survivor syndrome where people start to question, well, you know, why was it Marie who's young with five children? Why was she the one to go rather than me who's older, etc.? Those kinds of things we may start to see more mistrust of colleagues. We may be wondering, have they had coronavirus? Are they still contagious? Are they mixing with people who have coronavirus? And all those kinds of negative sentiments. We will possibly see people coming to work with grief, maybe grief that they haven't expressed to colleagues, grief because they've lost family members with coronavirus or possibly friends, colleagues. We may see resentment, so where we've had organisations who have uh, sent some people home to work but have insisted that other people carry on as normal, we may see resentment against home workers. We are likely to see stress and exhaustion for those people who've had to continue to work as normal in physical locations. And we've all, we're also starting to see additional issues for people who are taking sensitive work home, who are working with perhaps work that is related to trauma in what is what should be their safe space, their home. And we're, we're keeping an eye on that. And in fact, we're shortly going to publish a paper over the next couple of weeks, which will detail our findings to date on that. So in terms of the impact of recovery, Sorry, I pressed the wrong button again. I do apologize. So in terms of, of how we get people back to work and functioning, I think there is a role for all of us. And what I've done, I've, I've identified what I think key people might need to do in order to support people. So if we start off with managers, I think one of the things that managers are going to have to do is to try and open a dialogue with staff before they to return to work about what they're actually going to need in order to feel comfortable and confident about returning. And there's going to be a need for managers to be very open and honest. For example, there's no point in promising staff that work premises shared will be thoroughly cleaned every day if that's not physically possible. Managers are also going to have to be more visible than usual. They're going to have to work harder, I think, at building trust again. 
they're going to have to be very empathetic and they're also going to have to encourage staff to talk about how they feel. Levels of emotion are going to be much higher, levels of fear are going to be much higher and managers are going to have to learn to work with that and support people with those emotions. Managers may also have to help people socialize and connect in a safe way because when people do return to work, it's not going to be like it was before. They're not necessarily going to be sat with colleagues. They might be in separate rooms from colleagues. They might be working alone in a room. So there might be this effort needed to help people reconnect and socialize. And it's worth remembering that everyone is different a manager is going to have to recognize that people will have different reactions and will be dealing with COVID in different ways and be prepared to offer differential kinds of support. They're also going to have to be vigilant for any, any staff, sorry, any signs that staff are struggling, extra vigilant in fact. It's going to be important to keep reminding staff of the support available within the organization and also any support available externally. They're going to have to be flexible out about working hours. People may still have children at home who are experiencing homeschooling. They may be worried about using public transport and may want to use transport at a time when it's quieter. So I think flexibility is going to be key in so many ways. And I think managers and in, in fact organizations per se are going to have to focus on well-being and not productivity. And I think by focusing on well-being, if they get it right, they will get that productivity, but they're going to need to focus on the well-being first. And I guess it goes without saying, it's going to be important for managers to maintain their own well-being. And in terms of leaders, there's going to be additional roles for leaders a typical response for leaders during crisis to, is to move straight into command and control. And that is exactly the opposite of what we're going to need at this time. We're going to need emotionally intelligent, empathic leaders who can focus on creating real engagement with staff and use the knowledge and opinions of staff to help create safe, productive and, and welcoming environments. Once again, they're going to have to build trust they're going to have to learn to, to make mental health even more of a priori priority and reducing stigma. They're going to be, I suppose, tasked with not only thinking about those people who are struggling, but also put measures in place that will prevent anyone from struggling, preventative measures that will facilitate higher levels of organizational well-being. Once again, they're going to have to embrace flexibility and they're also maybe going to have to address their own well-being and resilience because there are going to be some tough challenges as we move forward from this. And then health and safety practitioners. Health and safety practitioners, as always, are going to have a, a key role in this. And I think going forward, there is going to be more of an emphasis for them on helping implement regular well-being audience, uh, audits to identify broad psychosocial risks and also it's going to be key for them to take a proactive approach to facilitating higher levels of mental well-being. They're going to have a role in encouraging managers and leaders to play their roles in managing psychological risk and well-being and to keep emphasizing the importance of preventative measures and reassuring staff that their safety is paramount. It's going to be important for them to, to collaborate with leaders and staff to implement well-being strategies that will actually work to everyone's benefit and make a difference. And also it's important to, to remember some of the Im impact on mental health that COVID is having and will continue to have and be extra vigilant around safety critical roles because we have in recent times seen some very dramatic examples uh, of what can happen with people in critical safety roles experience mental health issues like the, the German Wings incident. And for us as occupational psychologists, I think there is plenty that, that we can do to, in this situation. So we can help design effective well-being audit tools and help organizations implement proactive well-being. We can help organizations identify and develop the best well-being strategy for them. 
We can help organizations design work and jobs that's going to work during this COVID situation, but also maximize the well-being and engagement of their staff at this time. We can coach and develop leaders to better engage and support their workforce. We can also help organizations design supportive cultures that will facilitate well-being. We can help train staff and managers to manage staff well-being better and help organizations manage some of the change process that they're going to have, change processes that they're going to have to go through to be productive going forward. And Sharon, thank you very much. This is a, a fantastic introduction to everything. And I do think we, we need to move on because there are other speakers now as well. So oh, okay, if, you, if you give me interrupting, um, uh, I, we, we do need to uh, get as, as much of this information from different perspectives over as, as possible. So um, thank you, Sharon, for that excellent start. And now we'll turn to Emma, Emma Mamo. In 2007, Emma joined the policy and campaigns team at MIND. She is currently the policy and campaigns manager of the social inclusion and rights team, which works on a range of issues relating to promotion, promoting social inclusion and upholding the human rights of people with mental distress, including employment, benefits, welfare reform, debt and poverty, access to the criminal work system, equality and discrimination law. Uh, Emma previously led MIND's successful national campaigns taking care of business, uh, mental health at work and in the red, debt and mental health, for which she won um, a well-deserved award. So welcome Emma and please uh, carry on. Thank you. I think you have my old bio there and my old job title, but I'm Head of Workplace Wellbeing. I'll have to get that corrected. But thank you everyone. Very happy to be here today. Um, as Duncan said, I'm Head of Workplace Wellbeing at MIND, the mental health charity. So I'm gonna give a bit of insight from a survey that we've been running um, for six weeks across the lockdown period to kind of give an insight into the broad themes that we're seeing around the impact this is having. So leading on from what Sharon was saying, this is a bit of um, uh, research and insight that we can share in terms of the UK. Um, just to give a bit of context, and it's kind of been covered already, you know, this outbreak cuts across across all areas of well-being. It's hitting our physical health, our mental health, financial well-being and social well-being. The impact on individuals, I think we can all acknowledge we've been in the same storm, but we've not been in the same boat. And it's been really important for managers and leaders to really understand the individual circumstances of the people that they're leading while working in a remote or disrupted way. And I think we have to just know that it's the impact for an individual has been in multiple ways at different times. And I can reflect that from myself in terms of a roller coaster of emotions at oftentimes in terms of myself and, and the people that I oversee. In terms of the impact on mental health, well, going into it, we knew that there would be concerns around, of course, the health anxiety of a pandemic such as this, the uncertainty at an individual level, right up to what this means for our economy and, 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 and in that global sense too. And then obviously limiting our access to do the things that keep us well if we're experiencing lockdown and social restrictions. And then as Sharon talked about the bereavement and trauma that people are experiencing. In terms of the survey, so from uh, across the six weeks, we've had around 20,000 people respond. I'm gonna use the headlines that were running up to the fifth week because this was just before, week three and four were just before the announcement of easing of lockdown being um, introduced in the UK. So this data is then from week five and then you can see the real difference that that transition point has, um, has impacted on people. But in general terms, what we were seeing were adults and children and young people were continuing to adjust to the, the lockdown restrictions. People were less worried about getting um, food supplies. They were less worried about getting the infection. We did find that where people were experiencing poor mental health um, and what was driving that for parents and people from BME communities, when they were experiencing and reporting poor mental health, it was because of concerns at work. When we were looking at some of the gender differences, women were disproportionately being affected by the coronavirus restrictions. So this was around the loneliness and the impact that was having on their mental health. But also if they were struggling with their mental health, it was more difficult for women to act um, access support, namely because of childcare responsibilities. So again, that was a key difference that we were seeing. Um, where we had people who um, 
were living with existing mental health problems and around 78% of the people that responded have previous experience of, of mental health problems. We found that around a third of them were not seeking support for this because they felt that their issues were not serious enough given the impact that um, the pandemic was having on our health system. So people feeling like they didn't want to put an additional burden on the health system at this time, which is obviously a key concern if people need support, we've been trying to encourage people to, to, to seek that support. In terms of looking at people's coping strategies during this time, um, as Sharon alluded to, we did see people reporting um, drinking alcohol and um, impact on their eating. So over a half were eating either more or less than usual, um, around a third were um, using alcohol or drugs to cope. And then when you looked at young people specifically, around 18 to 24 year olds, we found over a quarter uh, were um, doing self-harm as a way to cope with the stress that they were under. So that is what we've been seeing generally over the first four weeks. When the um, announcement around lockdown being eased was announced, we then had people reporting worse mental health. They were feeling more lonely and less optimistic about the future. These slides will be shared after and during the, the webinar. So I'm not going to talk about this in detail because of the time. But I think you can see that people um, compared to the previous weeks were reporting um, less um, optimism about the future they were feeling very worried about what would happen next and this is a key thing around mental health if, if people are in a holding pattern when you come to a transition point that can then create more concern and anxiety of course um, and we didn't ask about return to work specifically but in terms of one of the free text boxes um, where people could share more you can see that this whole issue of return to work came out so we had people sharing I work in a school, there's no way we can observe social distancing. I'm worried about leaving my house and, and what this means around the commute and so on. And there's some examples here. So in terms of, so for me, I guess the things I've been reflecting on is that coming out of lockdown is not a simple reversal. This, we are in a very different understanding of this pandemic than when we went into it. We've been asked to stay at home. There's been anxiety created around those messages to stay at home to keep people safe. And now we're asking people to leave a place of safety. People's accountability, the accountability for people's personal safety has been sitting with government. It's now going to move to your employer, making your workplace COVID secure and all the decisions and actions taken by your colleagues and, and and, and the people on your commute. So this is the place that we're in now. Um, I was also asked to share a bit more around a survey that we um, did of employers just to understand the impact of the pandemic on um, how they're operating. We had around 800 um, employers reply to this. Again, I'm just gonna give some of the key themes, but most organizations are saying they are operating with fewer staff. Um, people are experiencing issues with remote working, concerns about health and safety issues while working in this way. Um, and while around a third of organisations have seen increased, dem um, decreased demand, many have seen increased demand on their services at this time. So if you can imagine, you've got less people, you've got challenges with how you're normally operating, and then you've got increased demand. And I think we can all recognise the impact that has for leaders. When we asked employers about what they were mainly concerned about in terms of staff, first and foremost, it was about their mental well-being, their physical health, and then of course, financial well-being. When we then asked what employers were then doing in response to um, those challenges, they said first and foremost, they were either promoting heavily what they have in place to support people's well-being, or they were putting new things in place, and or looking at their traditional provision and whether or not that works in a digital sense. Um, obviously taking advantage of the support being offered by government and so on, and then also looking at redeploying staff within their organisation to help with demand management and so on. So that was just to give you a bit of flavour of what we've seen in terms of minds work, understanding the impact of this on people's mental health, and then also in terms of workplaces. Emma, that's uh, superb. Thank you very much. That gives us uh, a little bit of science behind, behind what we all know and suspect to be true. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, so uh, moving on now to Peter Kelly. Peter is from the UK's Health and Safety Executive. He is a, a senior psychologist with the HSE's Health and Work Unit. Peter has worked for the UK's Health and Safety Executive for over 20 years. Um, he is a recognised leading expert on mental health and well-being and prevention of work-related stress 
and Peter advises on several European projects on psychosocial intervention. So uh, Peter, please uh, share your screen. Yeah, so um, I'm going to take you for a little bit brief tour really of uh, where I see and where, you know, in terms of the health and safety perspective, what we're, what we're looking at specifically around mental health and not around necessarily the physical interventions that will also be required. And actually what we will find is actually the psychology of this whole process of the coronavirus as we see means that actually people and the way people respond and react and work is gonna be very, very uh, indicative of how successful we are in controlling the, the virus as it moves uh, around the globe as we know. But let me just take you to where I personally see where we're at, at the moment in terms of what, we, what we're looking at for mental health. The slide won't move. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is actually a, a figure that's adapted from special forces. It's used by the Green Berets and, the, uh, and also by a number of other people as they prepare soldiers for conflict. And what is interesting from a psychological perspective is if you notice on the left-hand side of this model, you see that people's level of distress and level of normal functioning starts to, uh, starts to become increased. So they, get, they become potentially more depressed and show anxiety as you get in preparing yourself for this new conflict zone. And in the context of work like stress and mental health, this is where a lot of us were in February. But uh, the important thing I want you to see is that the, the, the bell, the curve, which we now are so familiar with, starts off very slowly and then, and then gets to a peak and then it drops down and then we're into this adaptive zone, okay? And this is where we've all been told, you've got to work at home or you, we, we're going to go into social isolation. So immediately we have to adapt to it. And it's the same in the context of, um, of people as they go, you know, soldiers going into a new, a new, a new scenario, you adapt to that because you're in it. But the really important thing to know is from this figure is just how quick that curve goes up, and that is where we are at the moment. We are we have people that have adapted to the new norm. Some that some of those didn't want to adapt to the new norm, and we've got others who uh, who are suddenly going back to work. And that mental health peak is what we're, we're seeing now and it's very sharp it's very quick and it's happening now so the idea that we can wait till we get back to work before we start doing something to manage people's mental health uh, isn't there because we're already in it we're already as emma has said and and as sharon has, has shown there are people here already experiencing mental health they're already having a, a level of distress which is marked now, what we want to do, and thinking about the concept of uh, that we've, we've all become used to, we want to reduce the curve, don't we? So we want to actually realise that if we can protect people and actually bring, create workplaces that create mental, mentally healthy places to go that actually incubate health rather than actually create ill health, then I think that's where we should be heading. And that is the only way we're going to get through the next few years is, is if we address both the physical and the psychological consequences of going back to work. So if we move on from there, because what we really want is to have a normal life. We want to go back to what is the norm, don't we? You know, you, you want to be able to go to the pub if you're me, because my pub is only 180 meters away. Uh, I, I bought the house on the basis of where the pub was. But the new norm is to, is to have that social event, but we're not necessarily going to go back to a new norm in the office, are we? The office was a safe place. Going to work was a safe place. And being in work could have been a safe place. Now, for some, as you know, Sharon and Emma, um, Emma have stated, it isn't going to be safe. Getting on the tube, if you've spent 11 weeks waiting to go back to work getting on the tube is going to be will be a difficult experience for some people more than that you're going to come into work with heightened level of anxiety and then you're going to go into work and we're going to ask you to socially distance and we're going to ask you to work differently we're going to ask you to sit at a desk which is which might be open fire or shared space and all of that's going to be have to re uh, re at and uh, and reappraised and what i think we need to do as Morgan Freeman says, as we work to find a new normal, we need to help each other to stay strong 
and hopeful, yeah? Because what we are going back to is a very different job and a very different off office space. And if you want to get the physical barriers to stop people and the pandemic, you can do that by doing that you know, physically, but compliance with it, and that's the key, will rely on the people and how we communicate to those people about the psychology and the, uh, and the psychosocial factors in work. And actually getting people to realize it's okay to talk from two meters. Um, and what we do with our meeting rooms, it's the unwritten rules and how we reinforce that and we positively do that. But people will be in there going, give me space. I want two meters. You're like within a meter of me. I need it. So there's, there's a psychological, a large psychological component that comes into that. And one thing about that is social distancing doesn't mean social disconnect. Okay. The one thing that we go into work and we really enjoy in, if you're fortunate to, as I am to work in a team is that you connect with the people around you. Yeah. And actually, that's what I miss. I can do this through meeting and it's wonderful to have that. But, you know, it's just it would be just nice to look across at someone's eyes while you're having a cup of coffee and feel like there's a human there uh, and there's that human connection. So um, what we need to do, we're going to socially distance is we need to create uh, workplaces that don't create social disconnect. So we need to think about how we message people and what we and how we do, how we say that. And we need to put in systems to allow for social connection at a distance. Ultimately, we need to keep talking and we, about mental health. Yeah, we are here and we're talking about it. If ever there was a time when a pandemic could come along and we were more pre better prepared, it is now. We have spent the last 10 years promoting health and well-being. We have spent all of that time saying mental health should not be stigmatized and that we should be doing what we need to do. We need to keep talking about it. And, we, and we're, gonna, we're gonna need to talk about it even more now as people return to work. But we're gonna have to turn the focus from focusing on teaching you as an individual to be resilient and mindful to also saying to the organization, what are you going to do to be organizationally resilient? What are you going to do to be organizationally mindful? And more importantly, what are you going to do to make your workers feel that their health is being looked after? And that's really, really important. One of the things you, people often say is, well, how do I have start those conversations? I put a link here to one of our talking toolkits, which helps you to talk through those conversations. But here's the interesting thing. If I go outside and I see a friend from two meters away and they're not having a good time, I'll walk with them and I'll have a, and I'll listen to what, what, what's going on in their life. Okay. Why do I stop that when I go into work? Why do I suddenly go, it's not okay to have those conversations. It, why is it okay outside in the middle of a pandemic, but not in the context of work? This is why keeping talking about your mental health and making it normal is really, is real. And that uh, Duncan, it will please eight minutes. So um, that gives that to just thank you, Peter. Question. Okay. I'll stop there. Bye. Some very powerful insights there. You know that sometimes the simple messages are the, are the most powerful, and thank you for drawing those across. I think there's a, a great deal of, of um, substance in a very profound way in what you had to say there. Um, so uh, moving on to our final panelists, um, Tricia O'Neill from Skanska UK. Um, Tricia has been the UK Head of Occupational Health and Wellbeing for the past five years. Prior to that, she has had roles with Procter & Gamble and Centrica and Sainsbury's, amongst others. And Tricia was awarded the uh, Chief Executive Officer's Outstanding Achievement Award in May 2019 for affecting change of attitude and approach to occupational health and to mental health in Skanska. So, uh, Tricia, please share your screen. Thanks, um, <clears throat> Duncan. Um, Skanska is a Swedish company with a global footprint and it's one of the world's leading project development and construction companies. And Skanska UK has circa about 5,000 employees and alongside we've got a sizable um, supply chain. Um, we've had a mental wellbeing strategy for the past five years and I'm going to share with you some of the interventions that we already have in place um, which gave us a good platform and infrastructure to deploy additional support specific to the COVID-19 response. I think people in general have been surprised at how they've reacted to this new way of life 
and the impact it's had on their emotional and mental well-being. So we've been through three big changes in as many months and I'm sure it's created all sorts of concerns and worries in many of us and some resonate more than others and I know that Sharon has articulated some of those from the worry and stress about our future, our finance, our health, our job security, the work-life demands, working from home in the demands, competing demands of family and children um, and the loneliness and perhaps the bereavement. So despite responding to government um, and public health England advice and putting into place the appropriate risk assessments and controls such as PPE, social distancing, furloughing staff, etc., people are still worried. And we shouldn't forget whatever their concern, it's real and we may not be able to reassure everyone sufficiently to return to the workplace for all sorts of reasons, whether it's because they have vulnerable people at home and they're shielding or whether they have to go at work, meet people, uh, maybe it's about taking the virus home, but it might create this health anxiety. So it's definitely about getting prepared and it's about doing it early enough to make a difference. So it's the proactive rather than the reactive. So how do we go about it in, in Skanska? Um, well, firstly, it was about preparing the business. So I'm just going to touch on some of the things rather than everything that we've done. But one of the things we started off with was using the emotional change curve, which is based on the Kubler-Ross grief curve. And this has enabled us to walk the business through each phase and consider, so what, we, what can we do? How can we make it better for people? So over the past 10, 11 weeks, we put in, in place a series of webinars uh, with a clinical psychologist that we work with, addressing some of those concerns that we were hearing about from why do I feel such so stressed now? You know, what can I do? How we connect differently with people in virtual teams. And some line managers really did struggle with not having their team uh, around them. And more latterly, we've, we focus on, so what have we learned over this period? Um, and how has it um, helped us be ready for the future and the changes that are going to happen. And we did focus on sleep in our mental health awareness week. I know that wasn't the topic, it was the original topic, uh, and I know it ended up being kindness. But as you've heard, some of the um, research that's recently come out, sleep has been one of the uh, main factors that has affected people early on in the lockdown. And because we have safety critical workers, we felt it was one of the, the key areas that we, we should uh, target. And at the height of the pandemic in, in mid-April, uh, the hospitals were manic, and this has had a profound impact on our healthcare workers, particularly our facility management teams, our porters, our cleaners. They were affected by just seeing the sheer volume of sick people and the number of people dying and the relentless workload that uh, was around that. So we held a series of focus groups to understand the concerns and then developed a program around it. So it was more targeted for that particular workplace. But their biggest concern was, what if I take the virus home? So we had to start preparing our managers and HR teams. Um, so uh, over the last couple of years, we've had a mandatory training in mental health awareness. Um, and this has definitely helped um, the managers support colleagues with mental health conditions in a more compassionate uh, way, as well as better understanding of what support they can offer and signpost to them. We provided them with tools uh, to enable them to have better conversations and we use something called the workplace adjustment plan a wrap which is an adaptation of a tool i think mind use um, and it, it just gives um, a tool that managers can use with employees so they can articulate if they have an underlying health condition mental or physical and just say on a good day this is the type of support i need but on a bad day this is the type of support i need and if you have those upfront conversations it's not in a rush. You don't make rush judgments. You don't have conversations you really rather didn't have. So we find it's one of the most useful tools our managers use. And our managers can, and HR teams can access the, uh, our, our team of OH specialists through our advisory lines. So they've got concerns or particular queries about returning to work. They can tap into that specialist resource. And we know that the NHS are going to struggle to cope with the increased demand about mental health support. So we've mapped out our own clinical support framework, such as how can we use our uh, uh, private medical insurance, our EAP routes to offer quick access to counselling and other types of treatments. And our operational teams have been coached how to use the vulnerable persons risk assessment and the controls and adjustments that we made to support people um, to return to work. So it's tailored 
So it's making sure that it not only fits the business need, but also uh, meets the individual need. When we think about individuals, our employees, it's a, we're promoting our EAP service, both the online and uh, the app. So we're pushing the um, app for our EAP service out to all of our uh, Skanska mobiles. So they have it uh, readily available. And then we promote the construction industry help fund, which is a free service for anybody who works in the construction industry and they can access um, EAP services. We have an online mental wellbeing resource hub that has been growing over the past five years. We're hosting the Emotional Change Curve Intervention Kit there, as well as a, a host of other resources, including um, the Mind resources. And they've got a really good um, uh, information about returning to work. So I really um, advocate going in and finding that resource. And we use Yammer and uh, our One Skanska channels to profile all those resources and support. And lastly, we have a robust mental health uh, ambassador first aider network. We've got over 350 colleagues who are trained up by Mental Health First Aid England across the UK that our employees and our supply chain can use if they um, want to talk at any time. So that's both in office and on projects. And it does get used. It absolutely gets used. So as we start to go back to our new daily life, both at work and home, um, we're undoubtedly going to need to continue both individuals and the business for many months, if not years. But ultimately, it's going to be the individual's decision whether to be at work, irrespective of what risk assessment or controls we have in place. And we need to be respectful of that decision. It is their health, it is their risk, and it is their decision. So we may find some, some people will not return to the workplace, despite all those controls, all that support, all that reassurance, until the COVID-19 is gone. But our role as, uh, as professionals is to support an in, um, at an individual and a business level to find that new way of working, to find that new way of coping with what's going on, and that it's not only safe in the workplace, but we're not going to do them any harm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tricia, for that, that insight into uh, what Skanska are doing. Um, I'm sure that many OSH professionals connected very much with uh, the, the kinds of things that you were, you were talking about doing there. I'm, I'm conscious of the time now that, that officially we have six minutes left, but um, I'm going to be a little bit maverick and allow this uh, webinar to overrun by a few minutes. So if you can stay with us beyond half past uh, the hour, then uh, you know, that will be grand. Um, we've had um, quite a number of, of uh, questions coming through, which I'm going to, to paraphrase and, and put to the panellists. Um, I would I'd ask the panelists please if you would keep your answers to around about a minute so that we can cover as much ground as we possibly can I know that's a bit of a challenge Peter but <laughs> <laughs> so, so if we can possibly do that you know a minute or so then that would be really good um, so uh, first of all um, Emma can can we come to you if that's okay sure. um, the uh, couple of questions have come through, um, one of which was, was uh, um, illustrated by a question from Andrew Cressy, who was actually talking about the fact that, uh, or, or relating to the fact that males are more reticent in the workplace to talk about their feelings and their emotions and, and their well-being than others. And, you know, have you got any advice on how that might be um, approached? Um, and, and indeed, you know, some people's personalities full start regardless of their gender, that they might be reticent about opening up and such like. So what kind of advice can you give to people, please? Sure, I think it's always difficult. I think, as Peter was saying, organisations that have been working on mental health and been having these conversations, I think may have fared better during this time because they have those strong foundations to build on. But I do think in terms of gender differences or just cultural differences around people's well having conversations about well-being, I think it's just trying to open up the conversation. I think trying to be vulnerable yourself and say, you know, this is such a challenging time at the moment. I'm trying to work out how best I can work in this environment. You know, it's a learning curve. How are you getting on? Can hopefully help people open up about what's going on for them and just saying is there anything more that we can do as a team that i can do as your manager or that we can do it as an organization and just make it sure that it's a it, you know it's a dialogue we've all had to spring into action quickly to change how we work and now it's time to say what's working what isn't what we're going to transition forward to and so on so i think it's just trying to have the conversation but if people are struggling 
sometimes they're worried about speaking up. So you just might have to say that this is an open door and, 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 and come speak to me when you need to, even if it's not a physical open door, but making, creating that space. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I can echo that. I think that certainly within IOSH, we've actually found that the more managers open up their feelings to their reports, then the more the reports are, are feel that they're able to talk about their issues. And we've also found peer-to-peer -peer support very powerful as well in, in, in the workplace, in supporting one another. Um, so if we can uh, move on to your good self, please, Peter. Um, when you were talking through your presentation, there was a flurry of questions that were very interested in your talking toolkit idea. Um, and that they, they, people wanted to know a little bit more about it and where they might find further information. So is there, is there anything else you can give us on that, please? Yeah, so I can do it in 30 seconds for you, Duncan. Um, the Talking Toolkit is on the HSC website. And if you put Talking Toolkit for work-related stress, when you get onto our website, you'll find it. And if not, I'll send you a link. Um, for those of you on my LinkedIn, you can, um, I'll, I'll put it up there for you as well. Uh, it's developed because people said, how do we talk to people? Really interesting question, isn't it? The same way we actually talk to people outside of work. Um, and I, I uh, you know, I, if you've seen me at conferences, I do go on about this. You know, uh, we, we, we can be human in work and, uh, and actually as we're human outside of work. And I just think that we need to humanise the workplace. Uh, and I tell you why, we need it now. We need it now more than ever because people need to feel that people care. And that's why we had the Mental Health Awareness Week last week, um, a couple of weeks ago, about kindness. Simple, random, or simple acts of kindness. Sorry, that was 42 seconds. I do apologize. Well, I'm not gonna let you feel hooked because you've got 20 seconds left, so I'm gonna give you a second question. Um, <laughs> also, we've, we've had a, a number of people, um, like uh, Kay Ortatepe, for example, asking about well-being audits and wondered whether um, the HSC had a view in the UK about uh, well-being audits and, and whether they were going to give any guidance in this area. If well, there's anything planned? Yeah, we, we already have existing uh, information about, um, you know, the, 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 the need to risk assess. So, you, you know, you, you do need to do a risk assessment. You can do a well-being audit. You've got to act on it. So that's the simple basis. Oh, my God, I've got a problem. I didn't realise. Well, do something about it because under every uh, global regulation there is, foreseeability and accountability become there. So once you, you know you've got a problem, do something about it. And I, I mean, why do this if you're not prepared to find out what the problem is as well as what the success are? So, um, so yes, there is guidance. We've got our own management standards, which is part of the talking toolkit. But every, each country that we work in, I know, have, have their own sort of, uh, you know, risk assessments and uh, call it risk assessment, you know. And if you ask people on a wellbeing survey, sometimes you get an indicative indication of what they what their stress is without actually asking about stress. I don't think you should be scared about asking about stress and mental health. It should be just a normal conversation, uh, like we're having now. Sorry. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to let you off the hook now. And if we can move over to your, your good self, please, Sharon. Um, there have been an, a number of questions uh, that have uh, focused around uh, burnout, um, particularly in, in managers and health workers and that su such like. We had questions from Andrew Young and Eric Hadima on this uh, very early on. So I was wondering whether um, you had any views on how to deal with uh, identifying burnout and, and how we can address uh, people who, who might need our support in that respect, please. I guess with regard to um, maybe the NHS, I think there will be additional measures needed for that. I think in the, the key to addressing burnout in, in the average organisations is around a number of things. It's firstly about identifying those psychosocial risk factors that are impacting on, on staff, things like management practices, job demands, the, the degree of autonomy, all the things that the HSE talk about and it's about making sure that people have adequate levels of both challenge and support in that yes jobs need to be designed in such a way that they're engaging and motivating but they also be, need to be designed in such a way that they have a cocoon of support around it so that if someone is, is starting to experience problems or they're finding the workload too much or the nature of the work too much there is somewhere to go. There is a manager who is supportive. There is a leader who recognizes that they have real issues and that if they say the workload is too much, 
It's not that they're not up to the job. It may well be that the workload is too much. So, you know, it's not rocket science. It's all the things we talk about all the time about listening to what people say about designing both jobs and work in a way that actually makes them human and doable by humans in, in the normal amount of time that we have in a working day and a working week. Okay, thank you very much, Sharon. And uh, um, last but not least, a question for you, please, Tricia. Um, there were a couple of questions um, th throughout the, the whole of the presentations that have centered around, um, I suppose, the nervousness and the confidence of managers to actually implement some of these, these systems. And there was even one, one um, question that actually referred to the squeezed middle management, you know, getting it from both directions. Mm. So uh, I'd be interested if you, if you could just um, expand a little bit more on, on, on what support you're giving your line management chain in delivering this program for you please do you mean in terms of the controls for returning to work the social distancing etc yes so is it not not just in terms of the controls but in in terms of their their confidence to address these issues mm. and and to you know do something about it you know because I, I i know from my own experience perhaps it echoes other people's where where people say all oh, that that's occupational health that's medical stuff and i'm not sure as an operational manager i should get involved with that because we've got specialists that we you know that we refer that to so, so what's my role in this so they feel very nervous about it they feel um, they lack the confidence in being able to move forward even though you know good toolkits are given to them and so on and so forth so how, how do you support managers to be able to implement your strategy i think that's a that's a good question because um there's they're all spread out so we have um a hub that obviously we've got all the resources we are um divided up into operating units and it has a head of um health safety and well-being and it's their role to cascade all the materials and support that part of the business to actually implement um, what we what we need them to do but in terms of the other point that you raised which is about the health aspect and that comes up so often in terms of it's got health in the title we're talking about a health subject here it must be yours you it must be yours to sort out but it is about having those uh, conversations, giving really clear communication, not only uh, as a webinar or as a, a, a meeting, but also in terms of um, um, the materials, the resources, the practice to do it. Um, and then you, in terms of vulnerable people, we have a risk assessment and, it's, and that created a lot of anxiety about, you're asking people about their underlying health conditions and we might get in GDPR issues here. Actually, you didn't need to ask that. You just need to, to know, is there anything bothering me? It's a bit like the rap form in terms of, you know, you have an underlying condition or you have a health concern. What is it I can do to support you? So it's actually offering people tools, the line manager tools, to enable them to have those conversations that they don't um, uh, creep into areas that they feel uncomfortable and not equipped to deal with. Thank you, Tricia. Um, so I, I really do need now to bring the webinar to a close. So many thanks to you all for tuning in today and to our panelists, Sharon, Emma, Peter and Tricia for giving up their valuable time and their, their information um, uh, for us all. Um, I would like to, uh, to end this session by saying that we will send you all a link to the recording uh, via email. So please look out for it in your inbox. And let me again remind you that IOSH has its own COVID-19 resources page. Um, with advice and guidance that, that is uh, free for you there um, to download. Um, and this will also be included in our post webinar uh, package. Um, uh, in the meantime, remember this series of webinars takes place every Thursday. So keep an eye on our COVID-19 webinars page for and our other IOS channels for details about our next webinars. So um, before I, I sign off, I think for me, the, the quote of the day comes from Peter. I think he gets the, the, uh, the applause for that. I really like that phrase that social distancing doesn't mean social disconnect. And I think that was a, a theme that runs through today. So thank you for that, Peter. So I'm grateful to you all for joining us and for taking part. Farewell, take care and stay healthy. <laughs>